Good evening, everyone. Um, my name, well, welcome to Hedberg Public Library. Uh, my name is Greg Devine. I'm the uh, uh, president of the Friends of Hedberg, and uh, this is my last opportunity to get to introduce an author. Um, this event tonight is sponsored by the library, but also um, in, in cooperation with the Friends, so that uh, we can excite folks to join us and be part of our group. Um, just so you're aware, the Friends of the Hedberg Public Library are a support group that uh, helps raise cash, volunteer many, many hours. Uh, and to make this place a, a little even better than it can be. I mean, it's already a great place, but we try to add some more frosting on top of the cake. So uh, we invite you to join us, and please feel free to be a member. We have some brochures tonight. We got you at the door, bothered you at the door. But if you feel, think about it and think, well, maybe I'd be a part of that, we'd really love to have your, your um, membership. And again, it's not always about how much you're forking out to, to help us out, but it's also about your time. If you've got something you're interested in here and you want to kind of help follow up and help the library out, we can use volunteers. And just, uh, love to help out, so join us. Love to have you. We're lucky enough to, uh, tonight, excuse me, to have a Wisconsin author. That's the best part of these presentations is you get to see the folks that are not too far away from you and what their what talents they have, and what they're doing. And so uh, tonight we're lucky to have a leading outdoor writer, John Motobiloff. Um, John is the author of Wisconsin Wild Foods: 100 Recipes for Badger State Bounties. That's a great title, John. <laughs> Fly Fisher's Guide to Wisconsin and Dripless Stories Outdoors in Southwest Wisconsin. John's work also appears in Gray's Sporting Journal, Ducks Unlimited Magazine, and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and he has just finished writing a novel titled Bohemia about a woman boat builder who lives in the Kickapoo Valley. As a bohemian, that's a very attractive title. Uh, John is also a book editor at the Wisconsin Historical Society. He and his family split their time between Madison and a cabin in western Wisconsin. John will share stories and slides tonight from his Wisconsin fishing and hunting adventures and offer a few fall foraging tips. His books will be available for sale and signing uh, after the program. And best of all, he's brought a home-cooked seasonal Wisconsin treat for everyone to taste. I can't wait. Please welcome John Motobiloff. First thing I'd like to say here is I'm just absolutely blown away by the library. I mean, it is just—it's a fantastic resource, and uh, I don't know, Linda and everyone who, who works here just should be really proud. I mean, I feel like we have a decent library in Madison. I'm not, not to compare, but this is just of, of another universe. Just absolutely, <laughs> absolutely a treat to be here. And I'm the son of a librarian, and um, lots of librarians who, who uh, lots of librarian neighbors. So anyway, it's it's very, um, very, very, very good to be here. Um, so what's going to happen tonight, first we're going to see uh, um, an episode of In Wisconsin, and they were kind enough to do a segment on, uh, how, many of you are, how many of you are familiar with In Wisconsin? That, okay, most. Um, public television show about Wisconsin people and, and places. And uh, so first we're going to run uh, about a 10 minute video from, from In Wisconsin, and then I'll get up and talk a little bit about um, my work, and about hunting and fishing, and about um, uh, some tips for wild foods and uh, interspersed with with readings too. So we'll um, we'll watch some a neat video and um, hear some writing that I hope won't put you to sleep too badly and uh, get some tips on how to how to cook uh, fish and game. Um, and then at the end uh, we've got uh, a, a pretty good pretty good meal to have. It's um, wild goose and, and wild rice soup and it, and it turned out pretty well. So um, with that, I'll let Linda roll the video, and then uh, we'll have other shorts to talk. The things we're thankful for, what's good about the world around us. With that in mind, we bring you the story of John Motoviloff. Like many people who live in our state, Motoviloff enjoys hunting and fishing, but he's also a writer who celebrates how those pastimes connect him with the land. Motoviloff took producer Joanne Garrett on an autumn walk to introduce her to his muse. There's quite literally no separation between woods and water. I've really never been to another place like it. Come on, girl. I haven't found anything that compares to it in, in, in beauty or diversity. I mean, it sort of has a gnarly, craggy sort of feel with lots of little valleys and lots of secret hidden little places. It's stunning. It's stunning. I've really Some call been. it the Driftless Area. That large chunk of southwestern Wisconsin, a place of woods and water, where the Kickapoo River snakes through. 
Okay, what is it? Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on, Tashi. A place of rolling hills. Maybe onto a bird. I don't know. She's getting and deep down. valleys. The part of the state that escaped those steamrolling glaciers thousands of years ago. Hunter, angler, and writer John Motoviloff. The driftless area, there's no continuous, unbroken expanse of either, you know, water or uh, woods or, or sky or even farms. Everything is sort of on a small, somewhat broken up scale. Patchwork of hills and farms, creeks and rivers. And there's always this feeling that there's kind of cover. There's some place to, you know, take refuge. That sense of secrecy and then tied to that sense of discovering all these secret things, you know, whether they're trout streams or little cabins. Or... It's full of secrets, I think, full of secrets waiting to be discovered. Wonderful call again. There was a barred owl calling. <laughs> it's a very rich kind of area, very rich in, in fish and game and uh, flora and fauna. It was the wildlife, the hunting, the fishing, that called to him, that helped shape his connection to this place. And in a wet year, this would likely have water standing in it, so there'd be, you know, the possibility of ducks jumping up all around us. I think it's my place, you know, I really do. Um, you know, I like to go up north, and I sort of like that, that piney birch landscape, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't weigh on me in the way that this landscape weighs on me, um, this sort of very, very unique mix of, of woods and, and water. The way a landscape touches you. Hunting and fishing are avocations. Motovilov makes his living as a writer. So when this wordsmith, who penned the nearly 500-page tome, The Fly Fisher's Guide to Wisconsin, found himself pulled in by the Driftless area. He and his wife bought a cabin here. And from the time spent soaking up this landscape, emerged a collection of essays, Driftless stories, all about hunting, fishing, and their cabin, and places nearby. The place is Gaze Mills. It's apples won first prize in the 1905 State Fair. And by 1911, the State Horticultural Society was urging large-scale production. Ninety years later, one can see they were right. Fist-sized apples hang from the trees in September, and now this hill country produce apples of national repute. Like a model village visible from the scenic overlook, Gaze Mills spreads out below. River, Main Street, steeples, butcher, Barber, tavern, gas station, a town plainly made. A town plainly made. Not far from the Motovilov cabin, also plainly made. No one is going to call this a second home. Um, I'd like to think that it's a step above a shack, um, kind of inching toward, toward cabin. We don't have any electricity at all, or water for that matter. It's kind of beautiful in, in, in a rough kind of way, I guess, a diamond in, in the rough. Come on, girl. Really rough. We are going to fix this siding. And it looks like heck, but basically what we're trying to do is keep animals from getting underneath the porch. We had a uh, squirrel and a mink that ended a game of chase in the cabin, and we came back to find the results of it. And it was, uh, I'll tell you, it was one of the most disgusting things I've ever smelled. A proper door needs to be built here, but in lieu of, of that, if I don't get to it this winter, this, I guess, will do. But in other ways, it's perfect. It doesn't get any better than this. A beer would improve things, but a ham sandwich, the Kickapoo Valley, a fall day, and my dog, pretty good. Mostly, it's a place where things move slowly. A down tree limb needs cutting, the porch needs a board, as the rest of the world moves at a pace bent on implosion. It's a refuge, a quiet hole in the woods, but also a getaway. What do you smell out there? Are there birdies out there? A writer's retreat and a hunter's refuge. The view makes up for the lack of fine cuisine. <laughs> 
But that said, there have been some gourmet meals eaten on this porch, like wood duck cooked in sauerkraut and venison grilled over maple sticks and uh, trout that have been caught only just a few hours before. Writing ideas percolate on the back porch. Let's go hunting, Tasha. Hunting opportunities beckon from the backyard. When paddling a skiff or walking in the woods, I find myself asking, where is the spirit of the animal gone? Stone Age man inscribed caves with fears and hopes and dreams of the hunt. Bringing this reverence to the duck marsh and deer woods makes the hunt a richer thing. Over here, girl. Tashi. I remember kneeling in a cornfield and crossing myself after taking my first wood duck. The earth was black and warm. This lovely bird lay beside me. Everything seemed fertile, generous, and good. By asking blessing, you recognize that the animal didn't die in vain, that it lives on in you. What is it, girl? Jeez, I mean, that's like a point. There's a, just an ancient partnership. Man, and then dog, and then the beasts below them, you know? And um, it just sort of, uh, the dog is kind of your conduit into that, that world. Somehow this element, you know, brings up all like old spirits in this place. Off to the sluice. The way the spirit of a landscape enters us. Never thought swamp could smell so good. The ways we form a connection to a place, to the land. I'll always come out here as long as I live. Here's a girl. You silly dog, you got cattail on your nose. It's part of me, just the way the a baroque looks or the way a sunset is out here or the way a trout stream looks. Those are the kinds of things that I'll think about in my deathbed. And I'll realize in some way I'm taking them with me. They're really the most profound things. And then you can own land, but you can't own those sensations. You know, they own you. In the end, we are all on the same arc. Body and spirit, man and nature dissolve, as Spinoza said, into infinite substance. Rivers are veins. Land is the body. And in the gathering dark of harvest, the fate of man and that of wildfowl appear the same, haunting the ends of the earth forever in flight. Well, thanks for bearing with that. Hope it was enjoyable. Um, some of you may have even seen it already. Um, so what I'd like to do is just begin by telling you a little bit about myself, um, and uh, maybe that'll shed some light on on the. Um, on, on the video, and then and then um, at the end we'll we'll walk through some slides, and uh, um, you'll you'll know a little bit more. Um, just just a couple of updates there. Hayes Mills, as as you may have known, was the as you guys may know, is was the site of some really terrible flooding, both in summer of um, 07 and then in spring of of 08 here. And there's still talk about it. they're not sure what they're going to do, whether they're going to move. I think they're going to at least move part of the downtown, um, which in one way is, is, is a shame, but in another way, you know, they just couldn't handle another flood. So I thought, you know, if anyone was from there, um, they, they might want to know, but that's, that's, um, that, that sort of bears mentioning because it's a, it's a special place, but um, I guess nature changes and we have to kind of change, change with her. But it's, it's hard because that's, that's a county where there's, where there's not a lot of money floating around. So anyway, just, just so you all have the update on that. Um, at any rate, uh, I, um, well, you know, how, how, did, how does a person get from, from where they began to, to, um, to where they are now? And that's kind of what I'm going to try to address. Uh, I didn't grow up here uh, in Wisconsin, and I, I didn't grow up um, at, as a hunter. Um, I grew up in New Jersey um, in a very uh, ethnic uh, neighborhood. Most of the people were, were um, either Eastern European or Italian descent, and I'm, I'm half and half. Um, so I, uh, I, I kind of grew up in, in, in another world um, and ultimately made it out here and kind of basically the, the, what, what I'll do is sort of walk you through um, how that happened and then um, also talk about um, cooking fish and game. 
So I mean, one of the things that, uh, that, that really, I think, sort of set the stage for me to, to be interested in, in, in um, the outdoors is that um, my grandfather um, came from, well, I guess you would, well, you would call it Siberia. And it's interesting because there's a, I, I noticed that there's a display on Russia out there. And um, he was going to be conscripted into the Red Army. Uh, and he didn't like that idea very much. So he walked basically from the Ural Mountains um, to, to Riga, Latvia, which is several thousand, three or four thousand miles um, with other family members. And um, by the time he got to Riga, he was, he was uh, taken for dead. He was in a, on a gurney. And they were going to wheel him into the morgue. And then he sat up and he said, I'm not dead yet. You know? so, um, and then he proceeded to get better and, and come to America. So it's, um, anyway, his, his, uh, he didn't talk very much. And his English wasn't very good. He, he was a machinist, really an excellent machinist, but um, wasn't a real verbal guy. But from what I understood, his, um, the, the, well, I, the, I know the, from family visits, or I know the landscape is very, very similar to, to, the, to the upper peninsula of Michigan or to northern Wisconsin. Very, very cold in winter, uh, a lot of pine, uh, birch, um, aspen forests. Um, in fact, uh, they, they were a certain kind of sandal there made out of, made out of birch wood. Um, and anyway, they, they all there um, hunted and fished, but probably not in the sense that we think of it today. It was more subsistence hunting and subsistence fishing, um, and as well as you know, small-scale farming or, or, or animal husbandry. So kind of backgrounding all this was, was my um, grandfather, um, who, who uh, is a role model in a lot of ways, a real extremely handy uh, guy, very, very strong. Um, and uh, carried a lot of these traditions, which were always kind of kind of there in the background. Um, and you know, did, didn't believe in his whole thing. He didn't believe in buying things from the store. He'd always make it. So that that anyway, that that's sort of the backdrop. Well, I um, grew up as a kid in in, in central New Jersey. Um, father was a teacher. Mother is a um, well a, a retired librarian who went back to work. I guess with the economy being what it is. Um, and so I was always interested in books and always interested in fishing, although uh, in outdoors, although there wasn't much of it in, in central New Jersey. Uh, we had relatives in Pennsylvania, so my brother and I would take, uh, at once a year, we did a special treat, we'd get, get to take the Amtrak train out there. Um, and we, we'd get on, and then it was real, very interesting because there were all these different changes. I mean, we, we'd first go into a city called Trenton, which is a very, very rough city along the Delaware River. Um, and I had never really seen poverty like that. So you'd see, you know, these small little abandoned, not abandoned, but these, these you know, semi-homeless people who lived, lived along the river and a lot of urban poverty. And then once you cross the river, you'd go into the Pennsylvania farm country. And that was just equally fascinating, fascinating to us. Um, and then once you got a little further in toward, toward I guess, uh, uh, Lancaster and York, um, it gave way to a hilly terrain, kind of not unlike western Wisconsin, and, and we would go trout fishing there with my uncle. And so that kind of piqued my interest in trout, which I, which I kind of carried through into college. Um, and then when I, when I moved out here, um, this is going back 20 years ago, uh, I finished my undergraduate degree, and my, my uh, then girlfriend, now wife, uh, wanted to be a teacher. And I, I was interested in going to school uh, at, at the UW and studying philosophy. So we ended up in Madison. And um, so I kind of first came out here and thought, well, well what is this? You know, where, where is the trout fishing out here? I, I don't, you know, the things don't look the same. Um, and, and, you know, it's kind of first year or so, it's kind of trying to find my bearings. And then I um, was lucky enough to have a supervisor uh, when, I, when I was working at the university there. Um, who, uh, who was a real avid trout fisherman, I, and I uh, actually hired me for a job, and I went, and it was a job in um, journal publishing, like publishing journals, you know, academic journals at, at the university press. And I looked, and he had one book that said, one notebook that said circulation, handwritten, which he kept a record of all the circulation of, of the journals that we published. The next one said county maps. And so I knew right then and there, and he had a big map on his wall of trout streams, and I had found someone who was going to, you know, sh show me around. And, and that began a real wonderful friendship today. Um, my uh, young daughter calls him Uncle Steve, that's my daughter here, um, calls him Uncle Steve, and we go hunting, you know, maybe once once a week, once every two weeks. Um, and uh, anyway, he, he's the one who introduced me to trout fishing in Wisconsin. And, if you're interested in trout in Wisconsin, typically you, you go into western Wisconsin, and that's what brought me out to the to the Kickapoo area there, and I just absolutely um, fell in love with it. I, I um, you know, we uh, my wife and I had a little bit of money saved, and um, 
we ended up getting a terrific deal on, um, on a cabin out there and um, bought it and haven't regretted it since. The uh, only other update there, though, is that the mice also like it, and they have, have really taken hold of it to the point where I had to pull the, the drop ceiling down, and uh, I can't poison it, really, because I've got a kid and a dog and dogs, so I had to put in, like, a, you know, mouse repellents and traps and stuff. So there's sort of a postscript on the cabin, too, that we're going to have to do some... I don't, I, I'm not sure the extent of it, but they're, they're in there pretty good. Um, so so um, what I'd uh, like to do here is, is read you a story about how I, um, how I got to, 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 our, to our cabin. It's kind of a funny little story. Cabin. It happened one night at the Essen House in Madison. A guy noticed the fish shirt I was wearing, and before long, we were talking about the secret hollows of Cooley Country, how we loved fishing these small streams. I told, I told him my wife and I had been looking at land there, abandoned apple orchards, Kickapoo bottomlands, rich uplands, but hadn't settled on a place just yet. He drew a map on a beer coaster, handed it to me, and said, "This is your place." The place is Gaze Mills. Its apples won first prize in the 1905 State Fair, and by 1911, the State Horticultural Society was urging large-scale production. Ninety years later, one can see that they were right. Fist-sized apples hang from the trees in September, and now a thousand acres of this hill country produces apples of national repute. Like a model village, visible from the scenic overlook, Gaze Mills spreads out below. River, Main Street, steeples. We drive down into the valley. Butcher, barber, tavern, gas station, a town plainly made. There's great relief these days in the thing that appears as it is. We're both, we're both struck by this, taking a left at the old dam as the beer coaster map instructs. The metal gate with the for sale sign is there. We climb over, walk the road turned grouse lane, and see a one-room gray cabin its porch overlooking the Kickapoo River some hundred yards below. It sits there in the dreamy heat of Indian summer, backed by a bluff, the smell of walnuts and hickory <coughs> thick in the air. We're sold the cabin and its two and a half acres for $10,000. It's a good deal then. And since then, where do I begin? Well, mostly it's a place where things move slowly. A downed limb needs cutting, the porch needs a board, as the rest of the world moves at a pace bent on implosion. It's a refuge, a quiet hole in the woods, but also a getaway. Many nights we've read by lantern light, <laughs> sung and played harmonica, gazed at a night sky full of beasts. We've heard buck snort, grouse drum, the who cooks for you of a barred owl, the wail of a coyote beneath the yellow moon. After swimming all day in Star Valley Creek, we felt the cabin's cool grass beneath our feet at night. We have bathed a nephew in a wash basin, shared frozen beer with old friends, filled a garbage can with hickory nuts with the help of my sister from New York. It's also a fishing and hunting camp, a sort of barracks where you rise before dawn, eat by lantern light, look at maps, put on woolens. At that hour of the day, the coldest hour of the day, strange thoughts occur, prehistoric cave paintings, where hopes and fears and dreams of the hunt are inscribed, of all the men and beasts who've walked the game trails along the river. Blue flame flickers on the propane stove. Coffee percolates. Eggs sputter in grease. In this place, in the foredawn, the world is a place of mystery. Also mysterious are the places it gives access to, the mighty Mississippi with its barges and bluffs like the humps of dinosaurs. The Kickapoo River slinking through bottomland quiet as a deer. Slaytons, oak woods full of grouse and squirrel and rabbit. The steep valleys laced with watercress springs. The bluff top apple orchards where Gaze Mills looms below like a bohemian woodcut. Things are not always easy. Southeast exposure makes it quick to heat up in summer, slow to warm in winter. Wasps lie dormant in the vents. Water must be hauled in each trip. A rough outhouse serves as a bathroom. 
and one July 4th we arrived at the cabin to find a mink and a squirrel dead and decomposed who'd ended a game of chase through a hole on the floor. But in the greater scheme, however, these are only bothers. I remember our first weekend there, coming down the bluff after a grouse hunt and seeing my wife's shadow bathed in lantern light through the window, thinking of all the words I know for home, Heimat, Casa, Dasha, and feeling lucky to have one. So that's a story about how we came to see the cabin. Um, so now I think maybe I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and, and, and be a little bit more um, concrete. So, um, you know, it's, it's fall here and uh, driving down um, on, on 94, just north of Janesville, I, I saw just an enormous uh, cornfield flight of, of Canada geese and, and mallards coming down. It was like a tornado. And I think with the wind that changed around today, um, there, there, I, must, I just had the feeling that it was, it was new birds in, and it just, boy, it was just awfully exciting. So I thought one, one of the things I do with, with the talk today is just talk a little bit about um, what you can do this time of year, you know, outdoors, um, and then uh, re read another piece briefly, and then, and then just run down some um, quick tips on, on, on wild food cooking. Are there any folks here, I should, this will help me kind of tailor the presentation, but folks here who, who cook uh, game or are interested in cooking wild game, maybe a show of hands. Okay, a couple, maybe about a third of the people here. All right. Um, but anyway, what, what I thought is I'd, I'd just sort of run r right now um, the kinds of things that, that uh, I would do if I didn't have to go to work every day. Um, and what I do do on, on the weekends is um, is a good, still a good time to gather hickory nuts and, and black walnuts. Um, and uh, even though the hickories are, can be difficult to shell, um, kind of a nice thing to pick them now and then in, in the winter time you sit around to put a blanket down by the wood stove and you you know I have there's a little vice that I have from that uh, Lehman's or Lehman's company and you put them in there and it, it cracks them pretty good and you know if you stay at it it's a nice way to, 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 to uh, pass a winter night and those shells are very good if you're ever cooking over a barbecue grill you can just throw them in and they give things a really good flavor so hickory nuts I'm not a huge fan of black walnuts but um, those can be had especially where our land is at, the, at our cabin there are tons of walnuts although I don't care for very much some people do um, Another thing this time of year, um, fall mushrooms. Um, and you know, some people, I can, uh, mushrooms are a thing to be approached with caution. But uh, fortunately, there, there are about, if you've got a good field guide, there are about three that are pretty much foolproof and, and very abundant this time of year. Um, puff balls, for one, um, very tasty. And uh, as long as you pick those, uh, the puff ball specimens that are like bigger than your fist, and if you cut it open there and it's white and solid and you don't see any sign of an emerging um, mushroom, you're good. There's a, there's, if, if, you, if they're small and they've got, it looks as if there could be something in them, you, you definitely don't want to eat them. But it should be solid, kind of almost like a, like a marshmallow. Um, and if you find that and it's white, you're, 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 good, you're, good, you're good to go. Um, another is chicken of the woods. I don't know if any of you have ever found that. It's got an orange kind of top. Um, and a yellow rim around it, and that tastes quite a lot like chicken. You can cook that down in a cream sauce, and when you find it, the good thing about that is you tend to find it in very, very big quantities. Um, so, so chicken of the woods is another good one. And then um, also oyster mushrooms, which tend to grow down in the bottom lands. They, they have a sh shape like an oyster shell, and underneath they've got gills um, on them, and uh, they'll, they'll grow on willow trees, they'll grow on hackberry trees. Um, you know, if we get so this turns a little bit colder, they'll, they'll, they'll be out of season, but that's, that's another thing that's, that, 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 that you can gather this time of year. And then, um, you know, just, just, just very, very briefly, I mean, it's, just, it's, uh, I mean, it's enough to give a guy fits when he goes to work, but, um, you know, like, over on the Lake Michigan tributaries, I've, I know the, um, the, the salmon and the steelhead are, are running. I, um, a friend of mine at work gave me some, and I smoked one of those up past weekend, so that, that's one thing that a person could do. I know on the white, on the Rock River and on the Crawfish River, the walleye and the northern pike get very active again, and that's, uh, that, that's a real good time. Um, and then in terms of hunting, I mean, this is just the hot, with, um, you know, pheasant season opening um, uh, Saturday, and then the duck season reopening, the duck and goose season reopening, um, and then 
squirrel, um, rabbit. Uh, there's, there's just and, and bow hunting. There's just there's just too much to do and, and way way too little vacation time. Um, so th those are just some practical things going on this time of year. And I think to tie together the the food and the writing and this time of year and this this friend that I referred to, Steve. Um, I'll read a, uh, another piece um, called Recipe for a Squirrel Hunt. Um, and this is about a, a farm <clears throat> near Black Earth where we, where we go squirrel hunting. Um, very, very pretty place. Um, and uh, there's a kind of meditative quality to squirrel hunting that, that's very different than other hunting kinds of hunting. It's, um, it's funny because you're looking up in, for your quarry. I mean, you're not looking in the air, you know, like, like bird hunting. But you're looking up in the treetops. It's just something, and then you'd be surprised just how quiet you have to be, and and um, well, you know, just how um, how stealthy you have to be there, and uh, just how how wary they are. And it's it's just it's it's a neat sport. And I, if if you and if you don't like to hunt them, it's just very neat to watch to be in a, a you know a, a nut woods and not bear around nut bearing trees and, and watch wild squirrels. So recipe for squirrel hunt. Steve Miller and I walked the fence row at the Lucy farm where oaks and hickories grew down a steep limestone ridge and a field to the right lay fallow. The woods smelled dark and sweet like chocolate, light rain intensifying the smell. Drawn by the smell to an oak log, I laid down my shotgun. Fistfuls of puffballs sprouted from it, leaves of rust and yellow behind. The puffballs came up firm like marshmallow and Steve bent down to smell them said they smell like truffles. When I sliced into one with my knife, the white flesh smelled of rain, frost, and nuts. I sealed them in a Ziploc and I and put them in my game bag. I must have been lost in the smell, for Steve now walked far ahead. We sat and passed the thermos cup. The bitter coffee cut the afternoon haze of soft-edged ridges and chattering swirls. I extended my legs out from the log at our backs, thinking of Rip Van Winkle asleep in the hog racks at the Catskills, the light timeless like the shadows in old dark paintings. It felt as if centuries could have passed. Gray squirrels moved in the big savanna at the edge of the woods, their feet scratching the bark and rustling dry leaves. They cleaved to the opposite side of the tree, and we were happy to sit. In the light rain, I told Steve, how I remembered streams like the Esophis and the Willow Wemack and the Catskills and lots of other tiny unnamed streams. Their clear, hard waters could have, could have cut the, the limestone of the next ridge. Even as we pushed deeper into the woods, through deadfalls and stickers, I was moving in two walls, worlds. I watched left for Steve's jeans and looked ahead in the dark branches for the shape of a squirrel. I walked bent-kneed through a deep ravine, moccasins soft on the ground. One, two, three squirrels scattered, the first a possible shot, but I waited, raising the gun to my shoulder, cradling my cheek, knowing one would show. My heart thumped, a squirrel, yes, but still fine game and choice woodland meat. He paused on a branch, shook his tail. I got him on the sight, released the safety, and squeezed the squirrel falling clean on leaves. It seemed good to clean the squirrel now. It was not some cold, distant piece of meat but an animal whose life I'd taken. I wanted to feel the heat, see the steam escape, not for the thrill of blood, but because we live amidst things, we displace them, and we have to respect them. Better to return home sometimes with blood on the hands than to pretend our houses and cars don't also kill things. I put the quartered meat into a Ziploc, then into my game bag. The wind picked up, cold and heralding November, as we walked to the car. It was dark as Steve pulled into, the dri into my driveway. Everything felt strange with no leaves underfoot, no chocolate wood smell, no Catskill light. My keys felt dull and cold as I stood in the foyer watching the traffic and streetlights like a boy called in from playing. I had rinsed, dried, and floured the squirrel, then crisped it in peanut oil and butter. Now I browned the puffballs and garlic in the same pan. The rich, nutty flavor filled the house drawing my wife Carrie to the kitchen, and the good feeling came back. I added sherry and stock and replaced the squirrel, watching the sauce turn deep warm brown, finally thickening it with flour. It all made sense as we sat down to eat, radio low in the background, Carrie sitting grateful. Wisconsin seemed like a lattice of ridges, 
and along these ridges and in the valleys, I was sure, other family tables passed a dish of squirrel. So, that's a squirrel hunt. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you very much. Well, I think what I'll do here is I'll just kind of run down quickly some of my um, thoughts and uh, recipes and uh, just sort of general approaches to wild game, and then um, before too long we can we can dip into some of that soup because I know I'm getting kind of hungry. Um, well, anyway, you know what, what I like to say with with wild foods cooking is that um, it really starts before before you're in the field. I mean, it start it starts at home. It starts in the way you you, you think about and prepare. Uh, for the game or the fish that you're going to harvest. Um, and, you know, I mean, if you break it down into three sorts of, you know, well, three or four sorts of categories, and you have fish, um, small game, game birds, and then venison. Um, and then really, there are just some very small things that can be done in each of those cases that make a huge difference down the line and how palatable, uh, you know, how good the stuff is to eat. Um, and, you know, they're you figure you have to store it, you know, you've got to, you've got to do something with it once, once you, once you, you know, take your fishing game, so you might as well do it right. Anyway, with, with um, fish, I, uh, you know, um, depending on, on how I'm, I'm going, with, if I'm trout fishing, I generally carry, I've got a canvas creel with some little um, grommets in the bottom. I generally will gut the trout there if I'm walking along or if I'm fishing for smallmouth bass in the stream. And then, uh, you know, just just got them on the spot and get get the entrails out and then and put the fish there. Probably often on a bed of ferns, um, and that keeps them really cool. I mean, there, you know, it, um, that that's the simplest way to go. And then I'll have a cooler waiting back in the car to put them on. Um, if I'm fishing from a boat or a canoe or stationary fishing for catfish, I always have a cooler handy. And I what I like to do is have as much small ground up ice as possible, so the fish really comes in contact with the ice. And then that way, you know, they die quickly, and it's pretty humane. And um, and then certain species, there's an odd kind of thing, like white bass and crappie, if you don't get them on ice, especially in the summertime, they go from being really fine eating to being really oily and strong. So I just always, you know, when, when it comes to boat fishing or canoe fishing or shore fishing, I just always make sure that I've got a cooler handy um, and, uh, and keep, keep them right in there. A stringer is okay if the... Um, you know, if the water temps are still cool, but a lot of times if you leave them on a stringer, the meat gets, gets soft, especially if the water is warm. Um, small game, like squirrels, um, you know, or rabbits, uh, I, you know, depending on the weather, I do one of two things. Um, if, it, if it's real, real cold, you know, the, or well, I'll say, if it's, you know, in the 40s or below, I'll, I'll just, um, I, I always field dress them on the spot, get the entrails out, but then put them in a, put them in a Ziploc, um, because, you know, you don't have to worry about spoilage. But if it's if it's warmer, you know, 50s or upwards, which a lot of you know a lot of September and October has been, especially the early squirrel season, um, I carry a piece of burlap. Or sometimes, if I don't get to that, I just take it like a Woodman shop uh, brown shopping bag and just roll them in that, just to just to keep the dirt off of them. Um, but something you want something there, you don't want plastic because plastic is going to trap the heat, um, and that's that's not what you want to do. And then you know all sorts of game birds, whether it's ducks, pheasants, grouse. Um, again, you know, if it's in that 40 degree or lower category, I really don't worry too much about field dressing them. If it's if it's warmer, um, you know, especially like opening day of you know of um, duck season can be, I tend to, you know, take take the entrails out pretty quickly and then and then put them in the in the game bag or um, uh, you know in a vest or or, or hang them in a, in a way out of out of light. And the same goes with venison, you know. Um, of course, you, you, you field dress that right on the spot, um, and if it's if it's uh, you know um, warm and you've taken your deer bow hunting or whatever, you really want to make sure you get that out of the sun and you get it into a shaded place. And probably, really, I mean, after it's registered, get you know in warm weather, get it get it butchered as, 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 or do your own butchering, you know, as soon as you can. Again, if it's if it's cooler, if it's in the 40s, you know, you can let it hang a day or so. Um, some people say that improves the meat. I, I really don't know personally. I mean, I, when, I, when I get one, it's, it just depends. You know, if it's, if it's a warm time, I'll, I'll, I'll clean it quickly. If it's, if it's not, I'll, 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 uh, I've got the option of, of letting it sit for a while. Um, so, so those are some field tips that you know, some of you may know or, or may not know, but seem, seem to make a, a real big difference. Because some people say, oh, well, I don't like venison. Or you know I don't like fish, and then you know you start to talk to them a little bit, and they're like, oh well, you know my grandpa used to catch crappies, and you know may maybe he took real good care of them, but sometimes if you know if it's a crappie that's been sitting you know in, in, in warmer water, 
you know, it, 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 uh, it loses something. So a lot of it is, is in how they were, you know, cared for prior to coming into the kitchen. And then, you know, what I'll do is I'll just run down, you know, um, those, these categories by, um, you know, and, and tell you a couple, you know, some of the things that I do when I'm in the kitchen and when I cook. So with fish, um, what, what I like to do is, you know, you, you want to know, you want to decide with them right away, okay, am I going to eat them? Or am I going to store them? You know, am I going to freeze them? You really, the talk, the clock is ticking with with fish pretty good. You know, it's uh, I'd say you've got about two days in the fridge where they're fine, and then after that, you know, you you, you want you, you probably want them frozen. So so um, and then if you freeze them, the important thing there, just like just about any kind of freezing, is you you really want to make sure that you um, get all of the air out. Now you don't have to go and spend a lot of money on an expensive vacuum sealer, but you can take um, you know like a milk carton. And cut the top off and, and, and put, the, put the fillets or the fish in and then freeze them up in water like that and then put it in a deep freeze and that's fine or if you get a ziploc you can you know seal up the ziploc real good with tape or put water in the ziploc but again you know the um the the air is you know like um you know air in the freezers that's what leads to freezer burn so you so you want you want to make sure you either eat them quick or freeze them real solid with with no no space to get freezer burned and just a couple of um quick uh tips for for cooking them i mean you know how do how do you know when when a fish is done? Well, one of the things you really have to put it into some very hot oil. You know if you're if you're frying it, and then you really keep a close eye. And just as soon as that trout, you know that eight ten inch trout starts to curl, or the uh, fillet starts to starts to you know just come up from the pan a little bit, you you got to want to turn it and cook it quick on the other side because they're much better if you if you don't overcook them. So so um, and then if you're if you're baking or grilling it. You know, when they flake, they're done. If you can get them a little bit before they flake and anticipate that and know that they're going to continue to cook a bit, that's that's probably a real good way to go with fish. Um, and again, that takes, you know, kind of a little bit of practice, but you, you can kind of see it once they start to get, um, if, you, if you see the slightest cracks in it, you know, then, then you know it's starting to flake. Um, with um, squirrel and, and, and rabbit, uh, what I do almost without fail, unless I'm going to do something like a sour rot, well, no, that's not right, a hassen pfeffer with, with the rabbit, is I, I uh, quickly parboil it first, and I'll, or I'll do a parboiling, you know, I'll have the, the, the animal quartered up, and I'll do a parboiling in, you know, some um, water, which I put some uh, vinegar in, cider vinegar, regular vinegar, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but that helps tenderize it. Do that real quick, get them out and let it cool. Um, and then really, I mean, honestly, <clears throat> like, like I said, unless you're going to do something like with a thick mushroom sauce, um, I think simple is best. I mean, fried squirrel and fried rabbit, once they've been parboiled, you let them cool, dredge them in some kind of cracker crumbs or flour, crisp them really good in, in, uh, in, in oil, and, and, um, and, uh, and then that's, that's, that's a really just a, a great way to go with them. But, I, you know, it seems to me... Um, Occasionally, you can tell, you know, if it's a real loose jointed or a smaller animal. You know, it's a smaller animal, but a lot of times you just don't know. You know, but, you know, you could have a young, large animal, or you could have an old, small animal. So the parboiling helps, you know, for for, for tenderizing, and I, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, game birds, uh, right across the board. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm a big fan of plucking. Uh, it looks real nice. It wastes less meat. Uh, there are a few cases where I don't. Um, your coot or diving ducks, and sometimes Canada geese can be a little bit stronger, and you sometimes want to get the skin off those. Um, but uh, all other birds, you know, um, if they're not shot up too badly, you know, uh, you know, mallard, wood duck, teal, um, pheasants, grouse, they, they look real nice and they, they stay more moist if, if you can leave the skin on. And what I like to do after that plucking is done is soak them in salt water, oh, you know, hour or two, I suppose longer won't hurt some people will let them soak overnight but that does a couple of things it helps get rid of any strong flavor it tenderizes the meat and then somehow or other you know if there's shot in there or bloody parts it helps that to that that, that, that clot a little bit and uh and so that that's always a very good thing to do with with birds um you know before 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 you cook them with game birds um and then you know a couple of my favorite things to do if, with ducks if it's got a roll soft, if they've got a soft bill, and if they've got you know flexible feet, and and you've got them in the you know in the early season, they're often a young of the year where they'd be very very tender. Um, and then uh, what I like to do best is just run them under the broiler very very quickly. Um, you know, 10 minutes for a small bird, 20 minutes for for a bigger bird, um, and uh, just very simply with you know oil butter oil, uh, butter 
salt, pepper, uh, maybe a few herb seasonings, and then, and then crisp them. Now, you know, further in the year when the birds are bigger and older, they, 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 um, they tend to pluck a little bit better, but you may need a longer um, um, cooking, cooking kind of approach. So, so there, you know, if you, you get your bigger, more mature ducks that have been feeding in cornfields or, you know, um, you know, a nice, I was going to say canvas back, but they're, they're not, you can't hunt them this year. Uh, you know, a good, good mature duck that you get in the middle or later season. Um, I, I, what my favorite way to do that is um, putting them breast side down in um, some broth or water in a big roaster, covering the roaster, putting, um, you know, um, any kind of fruit you want on the bottom there. Sometimes I'll put the stuffing inside, you know, sometimes not. Um, often throw some celery leaves inside, but you know, fruit broth in the bottom. Um, I'll smear a little bit of butter on that backside, that's up so they crisp. And then <clears throat> at the end, maybe the last, uh, what, the last, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, I'll turn them upside down, brush them with butter, baking grease, whatever, oil, so they get crisp on the top. And there, the, the breast where most of the meat is will stay moist because it's sitting there in the um, in the uh, in the you know the, the broth or whatever um, and then you know if you want to make a gravy out of it what I generally do is just pour off the drippings in a big thing put a bunch of ice cubes in the fat sticks to the ice cubes get most of the fat off and then thicken it with flour or, or, or whatever I don't have enough it's funny because the fat there it just I think it tends not to taste very good and that, that that's another thing I'm going to get to with with venison in particular um, you know, fat and wild game, it doesn't have very much of it and what it has, it often tastes strong. So I, I tend to get that fat out of the gravy and then just thicken it up with some flour. Um, and then finally, um, you know, venison, um, it's, I'll tell you, um, my way that I like to prepare it in the kitchen is to get off anything that does not look like the meat. So any kind of connective tissue, um, any kind of what they call the gray skin, um, any kind of tendon, you know, as much as possible. You don't want to, you know, completely shred the thing, but, but you, you get that stuff off. And um, I'll tell you, the best, the, the, the best venison I've had, hands down, is with a real simple marinade, which is, is in that cookbook, as, as are all, all these recipes and, 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 you know, these approaches. Um, make a mixture, two parts Worcestershire sauce to one part peanut oil. Put a little salt and pepper in there if you want, and then you put it over the meat and you let it sit, I don't know, an hour or longer, and uh, you cook it. And that's the other thing with venison. It's got to be medium or medium rare or else it's going to get, get leathery and, and not taste good, unless you're going to stew it. But if you're going to cook it in a fry pan or cook it on a grill, you really want to just, you know, go easy on the heat there. And, 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 uh, and you can, I don't know, the way I kind of judge it, I really don't like to cut into meat. It's a pet peeve of mine, but, but like, um, when, um, you know, when you make a fist here, if it's, you know, well done meat, it's like you make a real tight fist, you know. And then when you start to let up on it, that starts to look a little bit more like medium. And when you have it completely loose, that's kind of more like rare. So you could touch the meat and then see whether it's, you know, real loose, kind of loose, or, or real tart. And you, you don't, with venison in particular, you don't, you don't want, to, you want it to get um, too tight like that. Because then it's going to be kind of on the tough side. So those are my, you know, just some real practical thoughts. I wanted to mix in some practical stuff. People are going to come out. I always like them to give, you know, to give them something to, to go home with it, you know, in addition to the soup. And I'm just going to wind it up with a poem and then the slideshow, and then we'll eat. So this dog, um, Tasha, who was, who was in all the pictures, she's, she's getting old now. Um, I don't know. I'm going to South Dakota this fall, and I probably will not take her. We have a, a younger dog coming up, um, but she's 11, and... She has a growth on her leg, and so she can't get around very good anymore. But she, in her prime, an absolutely sweet hunting, you know, house dog, um, and a fantastic hunter with her little quirks and foibles. But she, she's she's um, a deer, you know. Um, uh, so I'm going to read a poem for Tasha here, and then and then look at some slides. So this is this is that magazine that I think Greg mentioned uh, called Gray Sporting Journal. It has uh, I don't know if it's it's in some libraries. It's it's a it's a little bit of a fancy, probably a fancier magazine than I might subscribe to, but they run good stuff on hunting and fishing. So this is called Black Magic, and it's about Tasha, who's a black Labrador. We hunt Macford Prairie's only cover, railroad tracks brushed with burdock and berry cane. It seems impossible, pheasants holding in this ribbon. 
but Tosh is on synth, squeezing like a black amoeba, under barbed wire, into warrens, now beneath a brush pile. Her tail beats tying like a conductor goading the band. I'm the idiot audience waiting for the show. Crescendo, it bursts out, cackling, brown, green, and red, and I miss three times. There are stories of circus trains coming up from Chicago, a seven-foot-tall gypsy, Dula Mostar, taunting hunters. You give Dula rabbit, Dula give you magic. And there he stood, balanced on the silver rail, collar about his face, hands cast aloft as if praying. You give Dula rabbit, Dula give you magic. Crawling from the cavernous coat sleeve, a pug dog, not a dove, which Dula cast above him into the heavens, never to come down. Now, a dim sun's falling over the miles of cut corn and silos. It's the last hour of the last day, and Tasha knows it, hunting hard, muzzle frosted. Now, pregnant silence above the power line hum. No jangle of dog tags, no rustle of brush. Touch this electric and go like Dula's pug flying to heaven. I wait at the silver rail, the whir of wings that wants to stay put. And finally, greatest magic of all, I'm swinging with it, connecting with it, knocking it down from heaven. So here we'll run through these slides quick and, uh, and then you might notice I talk about eating a lot. I'm really kind of obsessed with that's what I wouldn't go hunting and fishing if I didn't like the food so well. It's, uh, that's probably the main reason I go out. Okay. So I, I should back up a second. So anyway, a long time ago, about 20 years ago, 18, when we first moved to uh, here to Madison, um, so it was the first time I'd ever found morel mushrooms, and people said. You can't find, I, I, they said, oh, it's too late, and I had to, you know, did you ever get these silly ideas, and I'm going to find them today, and it was like June 10th, which should not have, it shouldn't have worked, but there they were, and they were fresh, too, so I was just real happy with myself, so. Okay, this, um, down along the uh, Kickapoo River, this is uh, our land that fronts the Kickapoo River there, and um, there are all sorts of fishing, the kind of fishing I like to do down there is fish for small channel catfish. And I'll just put a little fork stick down and a night crawler. And you know, they're not big, but they're those nice small one or three pound silvery catfish, and they're they're awfully good. So there's my friend of mine, uh, and we're sitting there. I think I had a strike there, and so someone took a picture. And that's summer, so the grass grows, but it gets real thick down in the river bottoms. Um, here's the view from uh, that porch that you saw, the cabin porch that you saw, when the, when the leaves are down. And so you're looking across. And on the other side of that bluff are the apple orchards, and then way down, like in the valley, from where you're looking, well, between where you're looking and, and, the, and, and the bluff there, that's the Kickapoo River. It's a pretty shot, I think. Okay, this um, was uh, Tasha's, was it her first hunt? Uh, about her third hunt, and we had been out to the cabin and we had a real great mixed bag. We put up a pheasant in one field, and then we were out hunting on the Mississippi River and got a couple of real nicely plumed up green wing teal and, uh, and a mallard and so we had a great hunt it was terrific fun and she came up to me and she gave me a licked all over my face because she was so happy and this is just another shot of the cabin this was before I built that enclosure on the porch and I built that because the mosquitoes out there I've never encountered mosquitoes anything like them they are just absolutely vicious and uh, you can't you can't you can't be outside and enjoy it unless you have something to put between them so it was, it's a it was it's really and so now it's it's a great place to sit uh, there on the porch um, okay. uh, this is just another piece of land that we looked at in that same area it's just, just kind of a pretty um, pretty pretty, pretty View, um, and that's similar, you're sitting up on a bluff and looking down into a, a valley. Uh, here is those wooded sloughs that they showed on the, on the In Wisconsin um, program. Um, this is a, a wood duck hunt there. I think it was maybe even opening day and um, made a shot and then was retrieving this. This was pre dog, so I had to do my own fetching then. <laughs> Um, this is a blind that I sometimes hunt on on the Wisconsin River, kind of near 
Kind near Portage, it's uh, at the mouth of a creek, and um, well, you know, if anyone is a duck hunter here, it's sometimes really good and sometimes really, really bad. And sometimes at times you think for sure it's just so cold they have to be flying or not. And I think that there was one time I was there, it was about, you know, 75 degrees, and I don't know what happened. Some birds must have migrated on the calendar, but they were all over. So that's one of the great things about duck hunting, it's kind of like get addicted to it because it's sort of like gambling, you know, you don't know what's going to happen and so you keep going because you, you, you don't know what the outcome is. I don't gamble, but it's, that's, I know people say it's the same kind of psychology. I guess this is probably retreating that wood duck that you saw earlier. And it, it really neat, there's a lot of, um, the, it's a good wood duck area because there are <coughs> flooded um, swamp oaks, uh, white oaks there, and, and the wood ducks come and feed on the duckweed and the, and the acorns. Uh, here is my dog Tasha um, retrieving a Candace back duck, which migrate right down the Mississippi River from um, Ferryville Pool is a concentration point for them. And we're, as a crow flies, about 10 miles from Ferryville. So oftentimes when I, this is a real rare duck, and they used to be the most expensive market duck in the world when market hunting was going on. And it's kind of a neat thing in Wisconsin that uh, that um, that, they, that they're still around. Uh, this year you cannot hunt them, the, the numbers weren't high enough, but um, they're real special and, and very, very, very delicious. They feed almost exclusively on a plant called wild celery, and they're very, very, um, I, you know, I can't say enough about them. Uh, another wood duck in a cornfield. Oh, I don't know what's going on there. Oh, okay, now here are the two. Steve is the fellow on the left, and then um, he's also a... Um, of author of some couple of duck hunting books, and, and um, Sam Diamond is a friend of mine on the right. He, he's a guy I go deer hunting with, and, and he moved out to Reedstown in the Kickapoo Valley, and we're going to go in, what, uh, 10 days here to go to South Dakota on a duck and pheasant hunt. So I kept in touch with these uh, two guys who I used to work for, and they're real good friends now. Well, like they're honorary uncles to my daughter up there. Mm -hmm. A uh, friend of hunting friend of mine, Greg Robbins, who's uh, the head of whose dog I, I cut off mistakenly there. Uh, hot day on the Mississippi River. It's so scary it can be just murderously hot down there in the continent. Uh, pulling out, I think, I think this was pre-dog and I was pulling out to pick up a downed bird. And that's the skiff that I use. It's a terrific boat pump. It's real, real stable. You can't flip it over. I, I've had my dog going absolutely crazy in there, and, and it just will not flip. And it's um, so it's good. It's a good. It's a good. You know, we take, go canoeing with my daughter in it, and it's um, it's a, it's the best boat I've I've ever owned. It's a real good boat. It was actually there was a company in Lake Mills that used to make them. I don't know if they still do. And this one came out of Minnesota, but it's a real similar design. It's just a fantastic boat. Uh, my wife, Carrie, um, we were bicycling in Door County and uh, uh, just a nice rock wave, the rock arch there. And then this is Steve, uh, the guy who's on the left in the duck blind there and uh, with a nice brown trout out on an unnamed stream in southwest Wisconsin. Has to be unnamed or else he won't talk to me anymore. <laughs> Is my brother with the brown trout caught in New Jersey of all places, which you wouldn't know has good trout streams and it has it has in the northwest corner it's got several good ones. Um, I think I think that's the last slide. Um, and then just real quick, um, I thought I'd just show you uh, this. Okay, I don't know if you're all interested in all, but anyway, so my daughter. This was her with her first trout, um, and then this is a decoy that I made. It's a, a bluebill or a skunk duck. Um, and I made it out of an old fence post, so um, just it, it's nothing. It's not real glamorous, but it, it worked well, and they deploy well to it. So I don't know. Um, get past one this way and one the other way. Um, so anyway, she's she's seven now. She's four there, but uh, that's with her first trout, which was a good one. So um, and anyway, uh, we can either eat, or I'd be happy to take some questions if you guys want. Um, you know, I. I it, yeah, why don't we do some questions? I, I while we're passing those around, I'd be more than happy if anyone's got any any questions to entertain them. So, yes. Do you have the name of a good field guide that you like to recommend for mushrooms? 
Yeah, kind of. Peterson's. Peterson. Um, that's a pretty good series. Audubon or Peterson's. I mean, and they're good. I think across. You know what I mean? Like they're good bird guides. They're good. Um, uh, they're good mushroom guides. They're good mammal guides. And then two, there's um, uh, a new guide out called Sibley's Guide to Birds. It's based on kind of a different identification system. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't have a lot of experience with that, but I know that I just like a buzz, there's a buzz about that. You know? So. Um, I was going to ask you about wild berries. Yeah. I, oh, I, I'm a huge fan of, of wild berries. Um, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, just you know, going along the road. The most delicious ones I've ever found are wild strawberries. You know, up, up in the Nicolay. Then sometimes we, I find them out in the western part of the state too. But boy, they're just unreal. And then the funny thing about them is they don't keep. Like you can't, you know, if you pick them one time. I remember I brought a whole bunch back to camp, and I think it was about you know a half hour walk, and they kind of almost disintegrated. It was the funniest thing. I mean, they, you can't really save them, so they got to eat them right on the spot. So those are the most delicious ones I have. And then the other stuff. You know, I just kind of pick a long road right ways. Well, I mean, I, I, some people may be better versed than I am. I mean, I tend to, it seems to me there are a lot of black raspberries growing in Wisconsin, and then a fair number of blackberries. You know, pretty good numbers of, of Concord, you know, no, they're not Concord, they're wild grapes, they've got some other name. Um, and then the strawberries are not, I mean, they don't grow in quantities that you can really do much with them, but they're, they're pretty good. And I think that a lot of those species that you mentioned were sort of on the southern, I mean, the northern edge of the range of those, you know. But I've not personally done elderberries or service berries. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, and a lot, you know, another thing real quick on that. If you look at the DNR websites and you look at, sometimes they'll be in the state parks, but a lot of times they do burnings. And then the berry bushes around the hunting grounds come back, come in very, very good. Like I know the um, Crawfish River, uh, Mud Lake Public Hunting Ground, has got a lot of uh, blackberries and black raspberries. And I, I don't know whether they encourage that for for rabbit habitat or pheasant habitat, but that's <clears throat> that that's I know that that's a real good DNR area to go to to pick berries. So, but that's the other thing you can often find them at the public hunting grounds. You know. Sir, I, I, I'm sure there are. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. I mean, any kind of like a road right away or a, some a railroad. You know, I mean, I sometimes will find them along the ra railroad tracks. Like I know, um, you know, the abandoned <laughs> railroad tracks or something. But yeah, I suspect you could probably do just as well over right around here. And it's amazing, like I live in a neighborhood, you know, and um, people don't pick their raspberries, you know, and I mean right in town, that's the other, the other thing too, is that there's a lot of stuff you can get really like, like right in your neighborhood, so they don't, you know, they don't pick them, I ask, and they say fine, you know, so I don't know, there's a lot, I mean, I should say that, that you don't have to even go anywhere a lot of times, you know, they're, they're right here in town. Um, yes? My family and I used to own a one-room schoolhouse in Richland County. Yes. And we only went there on weekends because we were from the Chicago area. But one time my husband accidentally left out a bucket of water and we caught him out. So every other time we'd leave water, a bucket of water. One time we, there were three in the bucket, never any of the traps. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried that? It's an excellent idea. It's so funny because I, I went... I knew that we had them. We had, we had left one time. I knew they were really in there. So I went and I set up a bunch of buckets of water and I put peanut butter around the side to lure them in, you know. Um, but yeah, I think that buckets of water, are, that's, that's exactly, basically that's the kind of trapping that I did there this last time and I have to go back to check on it. But that's, that, that's perfect. That's the way to do it. Yes, indeed. Well. Does your cabin butt up against Public land, a lot well, of what you were hunting on. Or it's, you do a lot of that's a neighbor. It's um, it's funny. It's it's there's neighbor the neighbors there, and they're real nice about. They're very generous about property access, except um, I'm not allowed to pick morels, hunt grouse, or hunt deer there. As long as I don't do those things, I'm I'm fine. You know, so I go squirrel hunting there a lot. Um, 
Uh, but it was funny. It was very, very clear, clear lines. And then a little bit, not at all far down that road, it's um, it's, uh, it's 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 DNR land. And then across in those sloughs, that's a, a guy who has got some bottomland farms, and he was very generous. So those folks are very generous. I kind of noticed a little bit, and this is you know totally to the landowner's prerogative, but that the climate of landowner relations, and some of it might be because hunters have, are not being real courteous, but you know there's that there's been a real shift in that, you know. Um, but it's just an observation. We eat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. And I, I love the library. I'm just I'm still blown away by it. It's just it's a fantastic library. <laughs>